Fisher. My name is Lauren Hunling. I'm the community historian here. It's a little bit different setup for us for our normal high noon, but we're really excited for how this is coming together now that we've got everything up and online. Uh, we are incredibly pleased today to welcome Tammy Holland, who's here to share stories about two really amazing Montana poets, uh, Grace Stone Coates and Gwendolyn Haste. Uh, we actually deal a lot with these women here at the Western Heritage Center, so we're really excited to see more about who they are. Now for Tammy, uh, Tammy is a poet and teacher, and she's the author of three poetry collections, including What Does Not Return from 2018, When We Wake in the Night in 2012, and Breath in Every Room from 2001. She's the winner of the Nicholas Rorick First Book Award, and she's a professor at Montana State University here in Billings. Uh, she earned her BA and MA in English Literature from the University of Montana, and she earned an MFA in Creative Writing Literature from Bennington College. Uh, Holland offers creative writing and poetry workshops in schools, prisons, and community settings. She was Montana's Poet Laureate from 2013 to 2015, and she's recognized for her ongoing efforts in poetry education. Uh, Tammy received the 2019 Montana Governor's Humanities Award which is a really amazing recognition for achievement in humanities fellowship and service, the enhancement of public appreciation for the humanities. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Tammy and her amazing research as she shares with us about uh, Grace Stone Coates and Gwendolyn Hayes. Thank you so much. Um, it's really lovely to be here today in this new virtual reality. And, um, and I want to thank the Western Heritage Center and Community 7 for um, their sponsorship and support of this uh, presentation today. Um, and what I've decided to do uh, is weave these two women together. Uh, they were friends and they had quite a few things in common and uh, often we see them presented separately, and so I kind of focused on their, their friendship and their similarities. Um, the real experts in this field uh, were Lee Rostad, who was a scholar of Grace Stonecoat's work, and uh, Sue Hart, who uh, researched uh, Gwendolyn Haste and wrote about her life, and in fact, um, Long ago, the two of them had a performance presentation called Grace and Gwenna, and they traveled around Montana um, offering these presentations to communities. And I, I still have my fingers crossed that there's maybe an extant recording of one of their presentations. So let me begin a little bit with just some of the facts. Um, Grace Stonecoats was born in uh, 1881. Gwendolyn Haste in 1889, which makes them about the same era. Both of them lived into their 90s um, and died in the 1970s. Um, they were both from the Midwest. Grace Stonecoats born in Kansas. Uh, Gwendolyn Haste, by various accounts, born either in Indiana or Illinois, I'm not really sure. The New York Public Library says uh, Indiana. Lee Rostad says uh, Illinois, so I leave that to some other scholar to determine. Um, both lived in Wisconsin, uh, both attended the University of Chicago, both ended up in Montana. Coates uh, also attended University of Southern California and University of Hawaii, and she didn't uh, receive a degree, but she did become a teacher. They, in those days, there was a teaching certificate you could get, and she had hers by 1900. Uh, Gwendolyn Hayes did receive her degree from University of Chicago in 1912. Um, Coates came west as a school teacher, and then she met her husband, Henderson, and they married and eventually moved to Martinsdale, Montana, which is uh, in the vicinity of Billings, if we think broadly, it's near Harlowton. Um, Gwendolyn Hayes came west with her father, who was editor of um, the Scientific Farmer. Um, it was a journal that originally existed in the Midwest, and then uh, Mr. Moss of Moss Mansion fame uh, bought the journal and moved the operation to Billings. And so um, 
Gwendolyn came with her father to serve as his assistant editor. Um, and this arrangement then, both of them in the same place, set the stage for the two to become friends, which happened sometime around 1922. Um, Coates had, had uh, a serious illness and ended up in the Mayo Clinic, and there's evidence that she received a letter from Gwendolyn Haste around this time, and, um, and writes very fondly in return but says that she is so used to her um, typewriter at home that as she, since she's writing by hand, she can only scribble a few lines, tell uh, Gwendolyn that she's very interested and would like to talk more. Um, and eventually then, um, the two would be together in Martinsdale for a short period of time. So my impressions of these two in terms of their personalities. Um, I think uh, Grace Stone Coates was probably the more introverted of the two. Uh, she, um, she speaks about her garden, she speaks about uh, how she loves to get up early and clean out the wood stove before Henderson is awake, loves to make her, her place uh, clean in that way. Um, she doesn't seem to know much about literary magazines, places to publish, um, and, um, and, and just does not seem like a social life is necessarily a huge part of what she needs. And there will be a poem later that maybe goes into that a bit further. Uh, by contrast, Gwendolyn Hayes seems to have had a big social personality. Um, she, um, what, I'm getting this information primarily from a paper written by Sue Hart, who, um, who has researched the material in the New York Public Library about Gwendolyn Haste and, and said she found letters in which uh, Gwenna, as she calls her, was talking about you know, the, the beautiful floral gown she had or the lovely gloves or hat that went with them. Um, and she seems to know, Gwendolyn seems to know much more about literary magazines. She corresponds with authors and editors. Uh, Sue commented about her sometimes flirtatious manner in some of the correspondence. Um, and, and later in life, after she had moved back to New York, there was a daily happy hour at her place uh, to which her friends were always welcome. So it would indicate a kind of social personality. So, her role in relation to Grace is that she seems to be encouraging. She's saying, why don't you publish more? Here are some places to publish. Here's how you, here's how you reach people. Um, and Grace is saying, well, I really don't know where to publish. I really don't know what I should be looking for. Could you help me figure this out? And when uh, Gwendolyn goes to visit Grace in Martinsdale, she, um, she brings her journals as gifts. Um, so that she can learn more. Um, Grace's first poems were published in, in 1921, and, uh, and this, it appears Gwendolyn was an absolute catalyst because between 1921 and 1930, in that period of nine years, she published over 100 pieces individually, which is quite substantial. Um, and, uh, and on the heels of that, came her three books. Um, 1931 was Black Cherries, a book of short stories published by Knopf, uh, followed, and, and two um, volumes of poetry, one in 1931, one in 1932. So there seems to be just a kind of overflowing of creative energy during this time. Um, in uh, 1922, I'm going back to Gwendolyn here. Gwendolyn won the award from The Nation magazine for her um, poem, The Ranch House in the Coulee, which is not really uh, meant as a separate poem. It was part of a whole series of poems called The Montana Wives. And um, what happened for her uh, is that in her role as assistant to her father, 
she traveled around to all kinds of remote rural places. And while he was busy talking about cattle and so on, she was visiting with the women and looking at their lives. Um, that's not to say that she's portraying any individual directly. Uh, apparently, she would get letters sometimes saying, who is that ranch woman in the coulee? I'd like to write her some letters. Could I send her some things? And she would have to say, you know, she's somebody I made up. Based on experience, but she's somebody I made up. Um, so these poems often portrayed a rather uh, grim existence. Um, to be fair, I should probably say there was, there was a terrible drought in the late teens. And so all of the hope that these people brought to the West when they homesteaded was um, you know, often devastated as they lost crop after crop. Uh, but here is this very famous poem, The Ranch House uh, in the Coulee. He built the ranch house down a little draw so that he should have wood and water near. The bluffs rose all around. She never saw the arching sky, the mountains lifting clear, but to the west, the close hills fell away and she could glimpse a few feet of road. The stage to round up went by every day, sometimes a rancher town-bound with his load, an auto swirling dusty through the heat, or children trudging home on tired feet. At first, she watched it as she did her work. A horseman pounding by gave her a thrill. But then within her brain began to lurk the fear that if she lingered from the sill, someone might pass unseen. So she began to keep the high road always within sight, and when she found it empty long, she ran and beat upon the pane and cried with fright. The winter was the worst. When snow would fall, he found it hard to quiet her at all. Other, um, other poems in this series depict suicide even uh, in, in the midst of this kind of isolation and, uh, and loss of social connection. But interestingly, uh, and, and this comes from something she wrote in 1960, um, it's not just this grimness that she saw, she saw also a, a, a kind of vast hopefulness. Um, so she wrote about, uh, Gwendolyn Haste wrote about the two worlds, and I'm quoting, the two worlds of Montana I knew. Um, she exclaims, the homes where those courageous ranchers lived. There was an occasional frame shack, but tar paper was prevalent, and the sod was still with us. Outbuildings were casual or non-existent. The men and women dressed for the hardest kind of living were shabby, with skins burned and hair bleached by the constant light. But it seemed to me a tremendous life, a shack perched near a scant water supply could have a scope across the world that took in majestic blue and white spurs of the Rockies. Where a primitive road twisted around a shoulder covered with scanty wheat or still gray with sagebrush, there would loom the mass of the Beartooths, the Judith Mountains, the Snowies, or the Bighorns. And the people were lively, healthy, and in those days before 1918, full of hope. And I um, suspect that it is some of this tension of her awareness of that hope and awareness of the predictability of the city versus that sort of hard scrabble existence in the rural life that also adds to the tension in her poems. Um, and they give uh, those poems such strength because she is often praised primarily for that early work. She's certainly known mostly for that early work. There is also tension in Grace Stonecoat's work, uh, and I might add, too, that tension is just a sort of invariable and necessary part of any art. And here I want to read from uh, the scholar Danelle Jones, who um, published an article about Grace Stonecoat's in um, These Living Songs, Reading Montana Poetry, which is edited by Lisa Simon and Brady Harrison, comes out from University of Montana Press. 
And so Danelle Jones says that Coates' poems often look at Martinsdale from the margins of respectability. She is never quite the faithful wife, never exactly the good housekeeper or the unerring neighbor. neighbor. Even as a newlywed, she felt alienated from this little universe of the prairie. Perhaps that's why so many of the speakers in these poems take the role of the despised woman. How wonderfully haughty, I think, to use a French expression to, ti uh, to title a poem about a misunderstood woman, femme incomprise. But the poem itself is so lighthearted, so comically illuminating of small town antipathies. The ladies who disgust me could hardly like me worse, for they embroider doilies and I embroider verse. While they're crocheting sweaters and knitting counterpanes, I'm picking out new patterns for couplets and quatrains. This theme continues um, in Grace Stone Coates' work. Uh, it's something I've always admired about both of these women. Um, their interest in the lives of women, the expectations put upon women, the tensions between men and women. Um, so in a later poem, and this comes from her 1932 volume, Portulacas in the Wheat, she has you know, maybe a little more generous version of that similar theme. This one is called A Word to God. Dear God, someday when you are done with greater things, set right this one. If there are women who like to sew and pile fresh linens row on row and make hooked rugs and needlepoint and crinkle pies or trim a joint, grant finally that each one win a home to love and keep things in. But if a woman likes to walk even wet streets and stop to talk to the florist's boy or the organ grinder, then saunter on again to find her a glimpse of the sea, a place to ponder why some take root and some must wander, or an empty church she doesn't belong to with a saint or two to make a song to, or a jeweled breast to question whether gems are a chain and love a tether. Give her a whole sky for her wishes, but never a roof with brooms and dishes. Then wrap all women in your compassion who weave your garment in various fashion. I find that especially interesting after having read some of the letters where she talks about cleaning the stove and making the place orderly. So, you know, she too was pulled back and forth um, in various ways. In terms of their publications, both were featured in the 1922 Mercury Reader, and they were the most prominent poets in Montana at the time, both publishing regularly in national literary venues like Poetry Magazine in Chicago. Uh, more locally, they shared their work in situations we would now call salon readings, which are very fashionable. During uh, Gwendolyn Haste's first visit to Martinsdale, the Coates arranged a reading at a local farm where the men seemed to be particularly taken with some of the Montana wives' poems, and Henderson remarked unfavorably about a farmer he knew in Shelby, Montana, whose wife had been isolated like the woman in the ranch house in the coulee. Later, Grace would share some of Gwenna's poetry along with her own at these salon readings and thus promote her friend's work. Um, and so this tension also interests me, that they are, you know, as prominent nationally as anybody uh, writing poetry at that time in Montana, and then working this sort of more local circuit. Uh, and, and maybe that has something to do, I think probably their support of each other in this has something to do with their prolific writing during this period. Um, so um, I'd like to share another of um, Haste's poem from this period. And this one comes again out of that series. Um, hold on, here it is. That series called The Montana Wives. And this one's called The Stoic. <clears throat> 
she guessed. There wasn't any time for tears because her heart had held them all unshed while one by one her little hopes had fled down through those racking, windy, drought-filled years. The frozen winter when the cattle died, the year the hail bent flat the tender wheat, the thirsty summers with their blazing heat. She met them all with wordless, rigid pride. And when sometimes the children in the spring, searching through barren hill or ragged butte, would heap her lap with local blooms and bring clouds, to, uh, clouds of blue larkspur and bright bitter root, then would she run away to hide her pain for memory of old gardens drenched with rain. And then um, I want to read just one more gem from this period, which is not necessarily set in Montana. And it, in a way, this is what interests me about uh, Gwendolyn Haste's poem called Aileen. It could be anywhere, but it portrays, again, a woman who, in this case, is playing a particular role, one of the few available to women at the time. And it appeared in Poetry Magazine in 1922. Aileen. She goes through the order of the day like a nun. The rattle of her typewriter is the rustle of a rosary. And she speaks in the telephone with the retreated delicacy of one who murmurs before an altar. It's a really brief little poem and interestingly paired with another that has to do with old men sitting with great authority at their desks, I guess the counterpart. Um, and there's something about the way she's written it that makes it seem, I think, like she's questioning the whole show. So in 1925, uh, Gwendolyn Hayes moved to New York, and uh, she had a career with General Foods from 1926 to her retirement in 1954. In 1927, H.G. Merriam, professor of English at University of Montana, editor of the Frontier Magazine, asked Grace Stonecoats to become his assistant editor, where she worked until the final issue appeared in 1939. Um, and, and here I just have to add an aside about the Frontier Magazine. If you can get your hands on it somewhere, if you can go to libraries and look through it, it's an absolute delight. Uh, some, um, you know, the University of Montana Library has the, the whole set from 1919 onward. Uh, we have some at MSUB's library, and I suspect there are frontier magazines uh, scattered around the state. And um, it's like traveling back in history to look through them. So, as I said, both women lived into the 1970s. Uh, 1976 for Grace Stonecoat, 79 for Gwendolyn Haste. One major question I have, and I have not come across uh, any particular evidence uh, so far, is whether they kept up their correspondence all of those years. Um, and I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, for both, there seemed to be a question about why there was such richness in this early period of their lives when they were writing about Montana, this prolific uh, production. Um, and then it seemed to cease, particularly with Grace Stonecoat. She published those three books, and it's as though her writing dropped off a cliff. And um, some would ask her about it, and she would say things like, oh, you know, oh, I'm, I'm too busy writing local news. I'm, you know, I'm tied up with the garden. I prefer the garden. Or on, conversely, she would say sometimes, uh, yes, I've been writing about this. I've been writing. I just don't have anything to submit when journal editors would ask her for things. Um, and uh, in Gwendolyn Hayes' case, I'm, I'm not sure how much she published really. Um, but Asato Press in Boise has published her collected uh, or her selected works, her selected poems, which seems to be the best uh, collection of her body of work. Um, 
Perhaps the most enduring literary contribution from Grace uh, Stonecoats came uh, late in the 20th century. John Updike uh, and Katrina Kennison published this book, The 100 Best uh, American Short Stories uh, of the 20th Century, or of the Century. Um, and Grace Stonecoat's story, Wild Plums, was selected, uh, which is, when you think of all the short stories that were published in that century, it is really an enormous honor. And so I think it's taught all of the time. Um, I certainly teach it to my students. It's a coming of age story set in Kansas, probably based on her own life. Uh, there's a kind of mm, well-to-do, uh, somewhat authoritarian German father, which is not unlike her father, as I understand it. And, um, and it's set in that kind of a uh, homesteading situation where people from all walks of life are put side by side. And so uh, while the German father would like to maintain the old status quo, um, the old status quo there's a, a poverty-stricken family that is in the neighborhood borrowing things, trying to invite the, the young girl to participate in the activities of their children and so forth. And we see the central character of this story carve her own way through this and separate off from her family's values. Um, so again, in this story, she's pursuing questions of uh, not only of uh, roles in marriages, roles, male and female roles, but also classism. Uh, and that's part of what's made this story such a, a wonderful piece. So um, if you haven't read these women, I would suggest that you do. Uh, there have been some um, recent, uh, more recent publications. As I said, uh, Asata Press in Boise has published Gwendolyn Haste's work. Uh, Drum Lumen Press. Um, in Helena has published Grace Stonecoats, two volumes. One, her poetry in a book called Food uh, of God and Starvelings, but also um, an unpublished novel, which goes, takes up, as I understand it, the themes of black cherries and sort of goes beyond it, uh, uh, again focusing on marriage, uh, men, women, and so forth, and it's called Clear Title. Um, so that is about what I have, and I'm open for questions. Um, yes? I, I do have a question. Yes. Uh, so it seems like both women are really writing themes contrary to what would be expected of women writers of their time. Uh, you know, they're, they're really kind of shying away from the sappy romanticism and, and the home and the heart. Instead, they're looking at loneliness and isolation. Um, do you think that that has any bearing on why they were so popular or the longevity of their work? Well, I think they were both, in some sense, writing out of this modernist tradition. And so if we look broadly at that, they're not necessarily um, that unusual. Edna St. Vincent Millay, for example, was writing uh, some kind of wild poems in this period, um, you know, uh, challenging, again, the status quo. Uh, but yes, I think it has something to do with their longevity. It makes them distinct. I mean, the other tradition that would seem to reinforce those traditional roles was something people were already beginning to shed. You know, the questions about classism were coming up in the teens. We're talking about the 20s now. And uh, yeah, people are questioning what, you know, this is not who I am. <laughs> Why should I, right? Why should I submit to these expectations? Yeah. I'm just checking Facebook to see if anybody had any questions. Or okay, anything. sure. You had mentioned that some of them were sent to New York. Yes. Was it after that that the Grace Jones, that her writing kind of trickled off, or did she continue to publish <laughs> after when you mentioned? Well, I, you know, I, I know they stayed in, in touch in the 20s, you know, 
uh, Greystone Coates published her last book in 1932. So yes, in some sense, there, there seems to be a correlation. Um, and I, they almost fed off of each other. Well, that's what I wonder. And you know, I, I think that's a theme that somebody could take up with and maybe pursue further. I mean, Lee Rostad has, some, has done some work with this. And, um, but if, if you looked at that as sort of the primary question, how much they helped each other, then other things might turn up, yeah. And there is, you know, uh, the, you will run into people who say that, you know, uh, it's good for a writer to be, you know, isolated, they don't need support, but that, that of course is never true. Uh, there's a long, long tradition of uh, particularly male writers bringing along other male writers, Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, for example, I, I, case after case after case. Um, and these two seem to have formed almost a kind of in, informal partnership of support. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, I will say that we, we do have some of Gwendolyn's poetry in the Iron Servant Safety Center upstairs. Um, but I think that's all I have to say. Well, thank, thank you, you again for having me, and thank you, Channel 7, for all that you do. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful.